right, so recording. Uh, let's go to to the page one page of 120 Design Lessons, day eight. Welcome to day number eight. Chat box. Let's see. So how do I do the chat box in the Discord? Yeah, where did I paste it? There's a channel right above the voice that says general voice channel chat and links. I'll paste it under general voice channel. Yeah, no worries. Um, not under OSE apprenticeship or because we should. Uh, uh, either, either one, we can decide. Ongoing events. General. Is general voice channel something that anyone in the world sees? No, that's us. Members of the Discord server can see it. So it's people who we've invited who have joined. But it could be you know, anywhere around the world. It's, uh, you know, Eric lots of uh, OSR plastic, like there are several people on the server already because they're able to see all, this, all the channels. The Discord that we're using, is that open source ecology or is that like anyone in the world sees this right now? If they join with a link off of our wiki page, then they'll be able to see it. Okay. So, all right, I get it. Um, I'll paste that under, I'll keep pasting under Apprenticeship Sims as well. Okay, uh, so day eight. Are you using a different mic than last night? It sounds like it was a lot of last night. No, I'm using my own mic. Let me just check this. I don't have the same pause as you have that message. The overall sound quality is even there. Not great. Yeah, it gets really bad. Um, let's see. is the front one from this uh, webcam? I think so. No, it'll probably be internal here. I don't think this one has a... You, you I'm not sure. I'm actually not sure. You have to check on the uh, options, otherwise it could be that webcam that's capturing audio as well. Hello, hello. Test, testing, testing. Now it's not coming through. What's going on? Yeah, it's not working up here. Five nine seven four. Test out now. Test, test. Okay, testing, testing. How is that looking right now? Yeah, it's not super clear. I think it's preferable to how it was before. Yeah, uh, yeah. testing, yeah. testing, 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 uh, so I should do it. We want to mute the sound from yeah. you, you have your headphones. I, that's, I think that's that probably addressed the echo right there, right? It's perfect. That sounded great. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Okay, we are good. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. So, uh, chat box, take a look at that for the day eight. I will share my screen here. go live there so um, can 
you guys see my... No, we're not going to... Go live. Okay, now? Now you good? Yeah. Okay. And we are recording, it's all good. Okay, so the document, let's take a look at that. The working doc. Oh my goodness. Not shared. So, let's bring that up. into the day eight. So if you go into the working doc eight, we've got a few things. Okay, so let's start. Uh, progress on the positionally correct house model. Uh, it's coming along. Joshua put in a bunch of these panels back there, so it's, it's moving along. I'd like to see if we can really find a clarity on that, that workflow. Um, through a little exercise, we can, we can do that, but I want to make sure everybody's on the same page with respect to the positionally correct collaborative large workflow because that allows you to do magical things um, uh, which I'll describe in a second um, in the exercise so let's do an exercise um, so that's going to be uh, just 10 minutes a simple thing uh, but before we get in there let's cover a couple other things yesterday we mentioned solving housing what does that mean so if we talk about the whys and, and the purpose of why we're here and actually taking on a bigger role and bigger mission that we can solve not all on our shoulders but collaboratively with, with, collaboratively with the rest of the world, what does that sound like? So uh, there's a page uh, document called Solving Housing. Click on it. It's editable. Uh, I made it editable. I already put down a, a load of notes over the study over the last year that were my insights and uh, insights of Katerina and uh, my mentor regarding housing that we've been developing. So you can feel free to add to it. Uh, we're saying point by point, this is what we're solving for, and the clarity on that gets us to important questions and therefore important answers. We can break that once again into the many elements, like say somebody's working on housing, then we can say, hey, uh, okay, either they have some of the elements that we need and we can collaborate with them, or maybe we can say, hey, look at this. You guys think you're working on housing. This is what solving housing is. This is, uh, we've got the feedback of many people, so let's develop this document to be a formable one, like a white paper for Bitcoin or, or some, a white paper for a project where you define some of the ground, ground principles that allow many people to collaborate. That's part of the collaborative workflow, that's uh, co collaborative infrastructure that's required for any project. You have to start with a big question if you want a lot of people to contribute to it. Important questions, important answers. So feel free, absolutely free to add to it. It's a formatted doc. It's, uh, we're breaking down to sub points. Don't worry about trashing it. It's got a version history. So if you if we don't like what you wrote or whatever, it's it's a wild doc. It's out in the wild. Uh, that's fine. Uh, at some point we might publish it and formalize it. Here's the freeze version. But in the meantime, we've got a version history that that tracks everything that goes on in there. Okay, so the second thing that you can add to is build pictures and video. 
Um, and, and this doc here, just, just to show you what that is, that's, we, we touched on that yesterday. Uh, what is it? Uh, so there's point by point. One is a, page one and two is a, just a generic breakdown, like a big picture breakdown, and I'm trying to get into the individual points, trying to explain the few paragraphs on page one and two. Those are loaded paragraphs. There's a lot of uh, information that goes behind that. So we're trying to detail that point by point, and the more detail we can get, I think, the more finely we can fine tune the answers and the questions that we're embarking on. So, so then let's look at link number two, build pictures and video. So we, all of us have got our personal time-lapse cameras. Feel free to add to this. So this is what, what we started already. And where is this? This is in the development template. This is called data collection and this is called build pictures and video. Uh, item 18 under life cycle design, which is really data collection. Uh, things around data collection and, and how you evolve the project by documenting your results uh, for the future because it's a, you know, an open source project is immortal once it's started can keep evolving so on the build pictures and video we've got some of the initial stuff up there um, starting with the foundation and then painting that's as far as we got there but now we can start putting in all the wall modules and everything else so feel free to add to it it's a nice once again it's a thumbnail plus so basically a screenshot of whatever we got plus the link to that and this is all in google google drive right now and your link would be say in um, your link would be say for example in youtube so wherever you put it just put a link to it it doesn't have to be on our servers or whatever our, our infrastructure as long as we can find it we can access it it's a distributed infrastructure for keeping track of all the pictures so that now we're in HD, so someone can just download our YouTube videos and create a video out of it. Like Elijah's doing video, and he might compose these into a, a more refined form. So feel free to add to that. Um, and as far as anyone who's listening to this this broadcast, um, the Sweet Home 3D model is, is on a Google Drive, and it's got the whole whole shebang. It's not broken down into modules like right now. We've got one through 69 broken down already for the FreeCAD files. We have no equivalent gallery for Sweet Home 3D. That would be a great, a great task for somebody remotely if you want to do that. And it's not wasted effort if you, because you know, even though the house is going to change because the Sweet Home 3D file, uh, once we reconcile it fully, Sweet Home 3D and the FreeCAD should align. Right now, the FreeCAD is more advanced than the Sweet Home 3D. We made a few changes in the Sweet Home, so there's a little bit of detail. For example, the position of the blocking and things like that, just detail. Uh, but largely, that the, the Sweet Home 3D file is good. Where do you find it? I would go to CD Cajon V2, CAD. Go to, in the index, see uh, Katrina's item 3, Katrina's source, Google Drive, Sweet Home 3 files. It's, it's the it's a 19 supporting CAD files. It's, you go to technical, and then you have the Rosebud Seed A. That's the current working model that you can download. It would be quite useful to break it down into modules because the other day we saw how the whole model, you have to uh, basically ungroup a bunch of stuff before you get to a very detailed file because that file's got thousands of parts. Uh, but every single wall module is in there already, so feel free to, uh, that would be a good point of organization, just once again, accounting of all the assets that we have. Okay, so next item is, um, go ahead. So, uh, I want to clear up on the, the reason we want how, how are the Sweet Home 3D and Tenet Cat, and like, how do they work together and how they differ? I don't know clear why we want both and what function the, the Sweet Home 3D serves. We want both because open source is always about and. So if you have additional effort, like for example, Katarina did that. She initially worked on, on Sweet Home 3D, finished it in 2016, and she does not feel comfortable in, in, sweet, in uh, FreeCAD. Like I'm trying to say, hey, just go migrate into FreeCAD. She says, nah, get out of here. So she continues working there. It's okay because now Sweet Home 3D allows us 3D walkthroughs, visualizations, nice renders, allows us to input all the furniture. So there's already a huge capacity there. So the two tools can work well together 
it's, for example, it's very easy to produce a part library within Sweet Home 3D simply by creating a folder with all the modules that you can effectively create a designer within Sweet Home 3D, which is what we would have to program using the OSC Workbenches platform within FreeCAD. So each one has its strengths and weaknesses. The FreeCAD is definitely going to do that. That's got the professional CAD level of design, including thermal structural analysis that you can do. Sweet Home is basically an interior design software. So if you want to soup up the interior, you'd go to Sweet Home and, and render it and it looks beautiful. So each of them have, have um, different purposes. And it's, but the main thing there is, since Katarina wanted to do that, it's like we give the autonomy people to do whatever tools they want to use. And that's fully enforcing. Um, I do agree that there's a bit of overlap and, and somewhat of a wasted effort, but in open source, it's not wasted if you're tapping talent that would otherwise be unused. Like, um, so there could be a whole project team around the, the Sweet Home 3D under the assumption that a project grows and becomes better. There's a whole development community behind Sweet Home 3D. And, and we probably want to do a very basic Sweet Home 3D designer for people who don't want to go into FreeCAD, because FreeCAD is going to be way more intimidating until we really simplify the, the interface and program that up to be as user-friendly as Sweet Home 3D. The strength of Sweet Home 3D is absolute user-friendliness. You can learn that in like five minutes, how to, how to design things in there. Um, and it has limited functionality, but, but it does give you other things like 3D walkthroughs. Um, or uh, the ability to embed that there, there's actually a platform online. Um, if you look at the Sweet Home 3D page on, the, on our wiki, there's an online platform where you can share models, so there's a whole infrastructure there already that we can tap into. And we probably want to use that, say, for our uh, product website, because they have really nice renders and all that, which you can't get out of FreeCAD. FreeCAD's going to look like FreeCAD. It's going to look like technical CAD. So FreeCAD, Blender, Sweet Home, all game. Is that kind of answer, or is it there un un yeah, un unanswered? Yeah, that helps a lot. Yeah. That's good. Thank you. Got it. So moving on, learning pro so actually, so David Leisure, who's one of the remote participants, he came up with, a, actually it's actually, I reread that today, it's very useful, but learning process methodology, how do we learn how to learn? Because here what we're struggling with is lear learning a fire hose of information and making that more accessible and, and easier to learn over time. So if you click on that, um, he, he wrote up a, a process for how do you s set up educational materials so that they're clear and useful. Um, I think it's actually really useful. And he, he basically took this. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a discussion here, like success mindset, why learn. So, so he goes through like all these steps of how do you treat learning. And he adapted this from, he's a, I think, I believe David professionally, he's a STEM teacher, STEM teacher. And so he thinks about education. But just briefly going through, it's like about your mindset. You have to know why. Of course, the why you want to learn the subject. You got to orient yourself. Prerequisites. You got to be clear about learning objectives, performance criteria. Like how do you know that you've learned it? You got to learn new vocabulary, so key terms. Like we learned uh, LOD level of detail the other day. Information. Identify useful resources. Plan. Develop a plan to meet performance then performing the learning. Well, we do a lot of that. We do a lot of performing the learning. We're diving into exercises that make us learn. But as I think about this, like we're, it seems like we're a little stuck on the, like say, the position to correct exercise. So I think it's worth, worth kind of reevaluating a little bit, stepping back and say, OK, do we actually understand uh, how to do it, and first of all, why we do it, and so forth. So um, this is a very nice methodology. Do, do take a look at that. Um, and David has proposed that from day one, so he took, took the day one video and on his log, he basically wrote up the curriculum for that day by filling out all those points in that document, which is, uh, I think, great. That's useful. Imagine we took all our videos and then we framed it, just, just increased the quality of the learning material significantly by following this kind of methodology. So do take a look at that. See if you can learn from it and apply it. Um, so let's try a 
since I think we're kind of uh, we we gotta we wanna master this this exercise this this collaborative workflow exercise. So let's take a look at page two. Um, so let's start with why. So this is kind of learning from the learning process methodology. Okay, why? Well, we always want to ask why. So we do some of this learning process methodology. I think David had helped refine some of the other points on it. So why? So imagine the future of 10,000 open source collaborative global villages worldwide in a few years, 10 years, 20 years, uh, or so. Uh, in one hour, we can design a spaceship or so solve any design issue. Right now, it's relevant. Why? Imagine having the complete digital model of the house after this morning session, if, if 100 people, say, knew this process, or maybe a few hundred people knew this process. I think it's very relevant. It's, you can really crash course the design time into, once again, from months to weeks and weeks to days, literally smash that design process down from months to literally days or hours. I mean, that's, that's the potential here. And I think it's, it is very important. It does require a level of collaborative literacy that completely does not exist in today's world. It's completely unheard of because all the projects people work on, like if you're in a company, yeah, you might have a, you know, a CAD team of 100 people. Um, well, first of all, they don't work with the outside. They, um, why would you want to work with the outside? There's a lot of talent outside. Um, they typically lock down parts and do their design workflows. But here, the potential is, if you can devise this workflow that's easy to understand with common common tools like FreeTag that are open source and available, we're unleashing just powerful design potential. So say that we have an equivalent process for biotech, we could have knocked out the COVID vaccine in a day or whatever, uh, include AI or just, just refine the processes of, of super mass collaboration so you can coordinate the efforts of many um, towards valuable issues. So let's let's try this little thing that we can do in like 10 minutes. So let's design a house in 10 minutes, a simple house. Uh, so can we do this? What I'm proposing here is let's, let's, let's do what we did before. So that is, let's do, let's do like an eight by eight house. It's, a, it's a, like a cubicle like we have over there. Uh, can we break this down with all the people in here and also the remote collaborators and within 10 minutes actually have a full model of that. Do simple things like do, draw you know, a square or your rectangle, but keep it to the correct dimension, keep it to four by eight, let's say. You know, do an eight by eight pad, um, select a wall, so select a sill plate. Yesterday we, we did a sill plate. We have to start by organizing now what the coordinate system is and like we did the other day. Make the coordinate system the bottom left, bottom left zero zero zero. As you're looking at the object, uh, we, we that's what we started doing here, and we're, we've got some of the wall modules, but nobody but two people, or three people so far, I think, or two people, um, <coughs> only put in modules there. We've got more people here, so so we're we're not getting it yet. Uh, I think with the concept. Uh, we can um, accelerate this just a simple concept exercise. Um, so you can do a simple thing, building on your FreeCAD skill and drawing sketches and, and let's not even do import from libraries, just, just draw up a, a 4x8 square to do a wall module, do a pad that's 8x8 eight and so forth. But we can divide this. It's an exercise of dividing, dividing the problem into parts that we know exist and we know are unquestionably there. And then we can divide that rapidly. So all we need to do is have that understanding that a house has certain parts and the ability to coordinate on, on different modules. So can we try this? It also tests the, the ability to do things like, okay, here's the XY plane. That will be the sensible thing for the, the location square. So an 8 by 8 location square. If we lay the modules on top, uh, we also have a top plate like we uh, in the foundation detail, if you take a look at that, we saw that, oh yes, actually, uh, when the walls go on, they don't go directly on the foundation, they go on, an, on the top plate, which which looks like this detail that we covered yesterday. Um, so, go to it. So you have to understand the design, like there's a lot of information that goes into that process. You have to understand basics of design, which just like, we know how to do certain things already. We have to learn, okay, this is the basic design rules of the entire thing. We know right now that the, that the walls 
sit on top of the top plate. Well, actually, it's, uh, it's actually an issue there. Well, no, that's my think it's a solution. Yeah, uh, that was the explanation. But you have a two by four, so we know that the sill plate is two by four. So whoever wants to take that, and we know it's a two by four all around the perimeter. We also know that the wall modules themselves are going to be sitting sitting on it. Well, let's not worry. Okay, so. Because we are, there's details like the corners, when you have corners and a panel that's got a certain thickness, you can't make all the panels eight feet. It would be a little larger than eight feet altogether, so you have to make the sidewalls shorter. But let's not worry about the details. Let's just superpose them. Let's just say we all take a wall module. There's eight of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight around the perimeter. We can define one through eight and go from there. So maybe even just simplify that. Let's do one through eight as a start and start with a, with a foundation which is at zero, zero, zero. So even before somebody draws that foundation at zero, 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 and we're going to work with the positive x, y corner, even before somebody does that, if you understand that, so spatial orientation, you can say, oh, okay, if I take panel, and let's start panel number one is right at the zero, zero, zero corner, and we're going to move towards the right, uh, which actually makes that, in a, from top, looking from the top, it's actually making that counterclockwise if you're moving right from zero, zero, zero. Uh, so let's try it. Can we do that? So eight people and uh, start at Z, like where the bottom left corner is zero, zero, zero. Um, so that when you put it, and you can test that, like as we all start, it's going to be really quick to put that location square so that when you build your thing that you think is the right place, check it against the location square by downloading the location square and going from there. Can we try that? Okay, so let's allocate roles. So we have the the, the document. Hmm? I'm a bit lost. Okay. So location. I'm going to take that. I'm going to do the. I'm going to draw the square. That's that's super hard. No. Uh, but I'll, I'll do that so I'm done with it in a second. So play. So if we draw the location square, the way we drew it last time, remember we put the walls right on top of it, right? So what does that mean for the so play? The sill plate is going to start at z equals negative 1.5, right? Draw it as one unit. Don't draw it as multiple. In real life, it's going to be multiple pieces of wood. But draw it as a square that's basically an extruded thing, uh, a perimeter that's a 2 by 4. Who wants to take that? Anyone? Anyone feel up to the challenge remotely here? OK, nobody. Who wants to take module number 1? Can we go down here, the window, module number one? Yeah. And keep away from the doors, like I, I put door or whatever. No, don't worry about it. Let's just do it even simpler. Uh, module one, uh, the window, camp, module two, rest, module three, Josh, uh, Paul, sure. Paul, module four, module five will be Joshua. Module six will be Prince. Uh, remotely, anybody available for module seven and eight? concept is the important thing. The concept here is that we define a geometry for some build. And we can define it clearly as we're looking at this object from the front. So we can define forward, backwards, left, right. If it's a house, we said, okay, we well, have the four by eight more panels. Let's just work with four by eight panels, not four by nine like on the first floor. Uh, let's just do the four by eight panels. How thick they are, they're 5.5 inches. But we know certain properties about what the design is. We already have that some of that information. If we built it on site here, we know, okay, these are these these wall modules, such and such. We have we have more experience on it here because we actually built it in real life. So it's maybe more tangible. Maybe the, the lack the more than maybe that's that you're not working on them and, and therefore it's a little harder to orient spatially and digitally at the same time. So we're combining physical reality with digital reality. And we're combining collaboration with that same process and an understanding of what the basic house design is. Does 
that explain anything? And then you put the walls up, you have to know the structure. Like we say, we, we start at the origin being where the first wall is going to go. Bottom left hand corner of the first wall module is going to go at point zero 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 on the coordinate system which is available within FreeCAD. FreeCAD has a coordinate system. FreeCAD keeps track of locations. Um, so if you have a large number of people who understand that, that this is a house, right now if we can scale this process up, we can design the entire house with a few additional pieces of information like okay the floor is so high this is how the the second story platform looks this is how now the second story coming up this is the roof but but here we're it's tangible it's even trackable because it's like only designing these boxes that are very very simple so conceptually it's it's tractable you don't have to have advanced super advanced knowledge to get the concept. And then you build upon this with further and further detail until before you know it, you've got the complete technical design. Now, there's also things like, um, yeah, maybe I shouldn't confuse it, but you can also build in things that aren't build features on modules that are not built yet. Does anyone understand that? Like, okay, so yesterday I think we came into an issue like, uh, like the enterprise session, I think we came into one issue was, was like, what do they know what the product is? How can we develop anything meaningfully? Well, here, it's, we're dealing with a similar question. Like, say you want to put the screws in into a panel that nobody designed yet. Well, when we know about the screws going into the, the wall module, we know that uh, if you put the, the front sheeting on it, you're going to put screws every six inches on a perimeter. Where? Well, the wall panel is four by eight. The perimeter is going to be that one and a half inch around that all around. So you know you got to put the screws in three quarters inch from that profile of four by eight. Well, the panel's not built yet. Who cares? Well, if you understand that the panel looks like this, one person can work on the panel. One person can only work on putting in the screws, even though the panel's not there. So you don't have to have a linear process. We're delinearizing it. We're making a non-linear collaborative process. Um, typically things go linear and things are slowly. We're discovering techniques where you can non-linearize and shrink, collapse build schedules and so forth. Well, I think that's the real value proposition that we can offer. Like once you get a good feeling for this, you see like, holy cow. Yesterday I was just in the morning, I met it, I was thinking about it. It's like, oh man, this is just unreal. Like we can compress build time compared to a professional team of builders. One win, hands down, 10x compared to like professional carpenters that just from time, because they do it linear. We can do it non-linear. It's like, holy cow, that is a value proposition. You can compress your typical six month build schedule into five days at the minimum or two weeks or so with, with the, the codes and, and having inspections go through. It's an incredible value proposition. So this exercise actually gets you into, into some of this kind of logic of non-linear super design by, by a swarm. Now, this is not that hard. I mean, I think to understand this concept, it's like, you know, I mentioned the concept of bit depth of human understanding. We're pretty dumb. We're like one bit depth of attention. We cut off our fingers on a chop saw because we forget our fingers and then we, we're paying attention to the wood. Um, but ants can do it. They can build an ant hill. They go one after another <laughs> and, and they compose this whole thing. Um, I don't know. So let's do as good as ants and create a big structure. <laughs> but, so it's not, not super hard if we get the concept of, of how we work together and how we break down the problem. Now the ants are building it linearly. They're like one, one needle after another and they make their ant hill. So it's kind of easier for them. Here we're trying to go non-linear using human brain capacity, which is a little more advanced than ants. But the uh, same concept that, that we can build complex things um, based on the idea that things are made of individual pieces that are tractable and down to atoms and down to subatomic particles. But eventually we'll have this visual fabrication thing like Neil Gershenfeld at Fab Lab who started the concept of Fab Labs and all that. He wrote a book called Fab and I think it was 2001 or so. So this idea is like a two decades old. Um, 
Back to, I think maybe even as late as like 2011, like this, this idea of digital fabrication has only been around for like a decade or so. But right now it's an amazing capacity to realize it. And down to down to atoms, right now the guys at Fab are, are working on atomic assemblers. So, and that's where it's going to go to. Like right now we can 3D print bulk objects and now it gets smaller and smaller. Like people already can center, like uh, with lasers, you can center metal powders and get that kind of level of fabrication. Eventually it's gonna, I think probably the, the end when it is, is gonna be atomic fabrication where you can actually synthesize molecules using the 3D printers of the future will actually be synthesizing molecules, possibly. Uh, it's not impossible. There, there's no ways you can do that. Um, it gets into quantum effects and gets much harder, but uh, it's not an impossible the problem statements, so, but here we're just ex exploring public design uh, using some of these principles uh, in a collaborative exercise. So, uh, actually, let me do, um, I'm going to do the screws for the first wall module, so just, just so you can kind of experience what this, this is about. But I know where the screws are going to go. I can just draw you know, placeholders, like basically little cylinders, I don't want to get into too much detail. I can draw that and put it right into the, the wall. I also know that let's let's do the five and a half inch modules right now. Um, I'll keep it keep it simple. Like let's let's do six inch, uh, six inch for now, because uh, that's actually just about the width after you put on the front front sheeting. So let's do like a six inch thick module and uh, put it on on the, on the suit. So can we start this exercise? And uh, let's see where we are in ten minutes. Like uh, I think if we get the concept, we can definitely do it in ten minutes. If we haven't done it in ten minutes, then. Um, let's try it again another time. But let's see where we go. So let's let's put a timer on. And yeah, does that sound good? Do people understand it? Thank you. Can I? Yeah? So, can I run this kind of as it works? Can I put a little gap for the location of all the modules? And I could have that time as part of my Create an, create a cabin, eight by eight footprint, meaning there's eight more modules. Each wall module is four feet, each side has two more modules. So so four sides, two modules on each side. So you have to orient yourself. Are you taking the front wall, the right wall, the back wall, the left wall? Um, so you can kind of you have to picture that in your mind. So so for me I'll do the first um, what I can do is I'll I'll do the first sketch and I'll put it I'll put the link up to it. Uh, right next to my name so that we don't have to mess with the wiki right now but you have to upload it because without uploading it you can't do it so on a wiki go to upload file at the end and just choose your file and upload it and put a link to it next to your name in a working doc can you try that and then after that what i'll do in, t in 10 minutes let's call it the cut of time and I'll, I'll download what we've got and i'll see if we have a house can we try it? We don't have access to the working talk. Thank you. Okay, I got it. Let's see. Nine foot tall? No, just do it nine. Just do it eight. Just real quick. Six inches thick, eight. Two by four by eight. That's like the second story. Um, if you want us to just create the sketch from scratch on the new existing module? Yeah. Just create it from scratch. It's really quick. I think that's the quickest. We're trying to get an exercise where, like, really quickly, we're demonstrating the proof of concept on a collaborative workflow that is like, wow, it's cool. Um, okay, so free cab. Uh, in ten minutes, I'm gonna set the timer. In ten minutes, I'm gonna. What I'm gonna go ahead. Okay, so questions. Let's get questions and any other concerns. I'm restarting the computer crash. Oh, okay. Computer crash. Uh, so in the meantime, as we we'll boot up again. Any other questions on what we're doing, why we're doing it, what the process looks like, what the end goal is? So that's the corners? Yeah, so we said the corners just overlapping for now. That, there's detail there, but just for the sake of this exercise, just overlap the corners so it's not accurate to real life. We're just trying to get the concept down. Is the numbering counterclockwise or clockwise? It's counterclockwise, counterclockwise meaning that if you're going, looking forward at the house, you're moving right from the front. So module one is zero, zero, zero. So you're moving right. Okay. Which, if you're looking from the top, that looks like counterclockwise. So is the slide eight by eight or is yeah. less? Yeah, make it eight by eight, just a simple exercise. So that the Put the eight panels fit to the fixed corners, and there's two panels per side that go end to end. So let's not worry about some of the corner details, just for the sake of the exercise.
Sorry. Um, anyone else who did not miss it who wants to roll? Um, Justin, if you can do A, possibly, otherwise it would be a gap. Otherwise, if somebody else take on module A, so feel free to. Um, well, the video's not up online yet, so then we got to do this. Any other questions? Where is the master document? Are we so individual? No. Yeah, so the master document, you keep it in mind. I'm going to upload like, the sketch of the, the foundation, the, the 8x8 square, like, right now. But you know it's at 0, 0, 0 within FreeCAD. This proves that all of our coordinate systems in FreeCAD are the same. That's important. You got, uh, if FreeCAD didn't have that, that's a major bug. Uh, and that needs to be fixed. But we're assuming, I, I don't know if it does. I, I think it does. It must. It's better. Okay, so I'm going to set a timer for 10 minutes, and we're going to do it. The wall panels are 4 feet by 6 inches? 4 by 8, and the depth of them is 6 inches. 4 feet by 8 inches. <laughs> 4 by 8 feet. So the standard wall panel. Are 8 feet tall, 4 feet wide, yep. 6 inches deep. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go... Timer, 10. Oh, let's see. Start. Okay, countdown counting, so I'm gonna go open up free cat.
Re-uploaded if somebody wants to eight by eight. I just the first one was four by four.
thing, just like just by panel. Is there something other than this thing? In the part tree, you should be able to just select your panel. That's right. Okay. So make sure you upload when you have it, if, if you have it, upload it by upload file on the wiki. everything that's been upload linked to the to the front page there I see there's four files possibly there you got to put a hyperlink to that there we got like one two three possibly four I'm gonna take those and merge them together into the final doc if you can um, still up while I'm merging it I'll, I'll add yours but otherwise I'm gonna just add what I have what we have so we got screws, and the file, merge, location, that I'm going to download. So I've got um, Wes, module 3, cabin 3, I'm going to download module 4. And now module six. I'm going to merge them all in. So now we've got file merge two file merge six file merge four. Look at that. So that's how it's looking. Um, yeah, I mean, kind of. It's coming there. So I got the screws for the wall one that doesn't exist. And a pad. And some of these are almost lined up, but yeah. Um, see any more that came up while I was talking? Four. One, two, three, four, five. We got five items. So yeah, I mean that's that's the nature of this exercise. Um, so congratulations to Prince, Paul, and Wes. We got those files in there. Um, not perfectly aligned there, but that's something. If we have those files already, then we can. Oh, it's just a simple move. So we can in this time. We created three modules that otherwise, so we compressed time here, you know, threefold or so, over one person doing it, uh, and then people who are still doing it can complete it. Um, yeah, 
So that's pretty cool. That's uh, that's an interesting exercise. Uh, it was for me. It was like, oh, that's really cool. I'm just clicking buttons to merge, and this, the things are coming in without me having to do all that work. That's pretty cool. Um, so you can celebrate success on on that much. There's a how to move and rotate. There's a video from like day one or two. So if you go to the channel, there's a 15 minute video with the insights on that. So if you have 15 minutes, you'll probably follow everything that's in there. I think it was pretty exhaustive, including how you have to, when you rotate and it disappears on you, you have to make a copy. You can't ro rotate things with sketches. So you have to rotate and move things. If there's a plane thing you have to select. And you can't, you always have to make copies if the thing underneath has a sketch in it. But take a look at that video. Uh, yeah. So what I'll do right here is just save this final file so that now, say we didn't finish everything, well that's fine. Uh, this exercise is still alive. And if somebody watches this video, help us uh, finish it. Or the people that have done it, just upload what you got. Maybe the next person can build from it. So I'm going to just do a quick save on this, which is the, the cabin, the eight foot cabin. Uh, I'll put it in the box so that anyone else can. Uh, so I'm going to upload that. You kind of have to get used to this whole workflow. Like, and there's a few missing you know, pieces like, oh, make sure you upload it, make sure you save it. Well, there's a few mo moving pieces. I think it's well trackable. So eight foot cabin, I'm gonna upload that. And then put a link to that in the doc. So so right there. I'm gonna say this is the cabin. Design. I'm going to put that free cap out to make that transparent. Apply that. So there you go. Um, anyone who's still working on this, oh yeah, so there's, see there's a few, see two just came in. So uh, that can be blasted in there. And Probably by the time we post this video up, you know, maybe maybe some of the remote people after after even the video is up, you, you know, if you keep this paper trail of where everything is, then somebody actually can fill in. So, you know, if you didn't finish it, it's okay. Somebody can take it, but try to maybe upload upload what you got and go from there. Um, so there you go. So let's let's finish that. That's an interesting exercise. I think we did okay. We we got a few few modules in there. And that's a great start. And if we can scale this kind of a process, you can see hope that um, large complex design can be done this way because after all, any complex design is made of simple pieces. And there is a significant amount of uh, kind of this basic technical skill to get there, but it's not overwhelming. It's like there's a few basic principles you have to follow and then, yeah, you can do this. So let's leave it at that. So let's wrap up the the morning design. I just want to do one more design item and that is how is the foundation uh, sill plate, which is the, some of the first thing, once we get to building the modules in real life, putting them on the foundation, there's just a little detail of how you do that. So let's, let's just go through the sill plate detail. So on a sill plate, so that's slide number three, we can take uh, let's take a look at what the sill plate looks like. This is now within build instructions. If you want to find this on uh, Seed Home 2 documentation, uh, so that takes you to to the sill plate cheat sheet. And this is what we're actually going to build. This is a little cheat sheet that shows a summary 
a little building, and I'll point to some details. So we know that the modules are all four feet. Now, what you'll notice here is that the sill plate wants to be continuous, so we're only cutting out as little as we need for the door. Uh, so you'll notice that the door, so the existing doors, the, the carport door is 39 inches while the module itself is 48. If you were to locate this at the center of this second from the corner module, you'll see that that distance would be 50.5. You can go through the math on that. Um, but this diagram here shows us all those critical dimensions. But the thing you have to remember is that it's 39 because the wall module sits on top of the sill plate. So we built an eight foot, mo uh, a four foot wide module, right? All the things we build are four or eight. So that means the door, the detail on the door, means that the door is actually, when we, after we put the door in, it's going to hang out, like hang down about one or two inches, one and a half inches, so that it, you don't have a one and a half inch gap under the, the door there. So that's one detail. Note that there's also a 39 inch door in the back, which is the expansion door, which we don't put in as a door, we put it in as a placeholder, but in order to make it very easy to add that later on, that door will have a special construction where it's got that piece to fill in what we cut out there. So that's a detail for expansion doors. For the eight foot door, the double door, the front, the big front door, the French door, that's the cutout there is 72 inches, the module is 96. So that means once again, that module is sitting on, on two bits of the sill plate. And why we did that is we do not want to cut the sill plate. The sill plate is pretty sensitive. You want to have a tight connection between the house foundation and going out. And the sill plate is supposed to be the bonding element to that. We wrap the mud sill anchors around the sill plate. We talked about in the foundation, we don't use bolts that go up through the sill plate. We're wrapping with metal around using a thing called mud sill anchors which simplifies the, the foundation build. But this is what you end up with. So probably the easiest way to build this, so when we go out there and actually do this, probably the easiest is, we know the sides are 16, the others are 32. Just use two pieces of two by four by 16, uh, pieces of that, work with that, because that's gonna span the whole side. So you have one piece on the short side, two pieces on the long side, and so forth. Now the corners, you're going to get into, sh into the issue there. Once again, you're not going to fit uh, the whole two of the 16s on the long side if you make the, we decide to make the short side, just use the full piece. It's convenient. Um, you can do the, you cannot do the, the other way. Why do we do that detail in the corner? If you look at the corner. We did that detail in the corner, in other words, that the 16 goes all the way to the top because the wall modules on top of it sit on top and the wall module bonds those two sill plates together. If you have the sill plate on the long side go all the way to the edge, then the wall module, there would be a seam right there where the wall module is not spanning the seam between the sill plate. So the sill plate is disjointed, there's a gap there. It's not bound by the walls that are on top of it. And the pattern that we show here, maybe let's uh, let's look at the detail, uh, just zooming into that. The way it overlaps, on the short side, you've got it going all the way to the, the back wall. So that when the wall module sits, it sits like this. Bonding, the two sill plates together. Okay, does that make sense? So that's how we do it there. And this is a two by four sill plate. And the insulation, which is 3.5, insulation is two inch. Which means that at the end of the day, when we have two inch, or let's look at the detail of the foundation. Uh, it, let's see if it's one and a half inch, because what you want to have is that the walls end up drooping over the insulation. So the pink is the insulation outside there. Let's look at that detail. Um, 
how thick is that insulation? If you look at the detail. According to this picture, what does it say for the thickness of insulation? If this plate is 3.5, then that is 5.5. According to this picture, the insulation is 2 inch. And then the, the front sheathing of the panel drips over the insulation, so you don't have water issues. And you have the, this is the detail we discussed yesterday, where you have this flashing, this flexible plastic flashing, just, just uh, thick plastic, it's vinyl or PVC. It goes like that, so that's the detail. Uh, in the picture here, Let's go back in there again. This picture here, so the insulation, like just looking at the insulation. What we're saying there is that the wall panel is going to be over this insulation. So when we put this, we put the interior edge of the wall panels right above the, the sill plate and therefore the exterior which is on towards the pink side the lip of the front uh, of the panels hangs over that so you don't have water issues that's that's the details that are required there and anything anything else let's see that we need to know about the foundation so what i would do here is probably want to do your first piece here and then attach all the pieces probably for the sake of how you produce this, it's easiest to, to do the entire sill plate, sill plate and just cut out the notches for the doors. You know their exact position from the diagram, like 146.5 here from the edge. So instead of trying to pre-cut this, I mean, one, one way you can consider is pre-cutting this, but you might get into some inaccuracies there that you just might want to just fit it right into place. And keep it to the the exact, the consideration here is you want to keep this to the exact 16 by 32. So, for example, if we pre-cut and it ended up being a little higher, well, we're propagating errors down the road. So, put all the sill plates around, uh, make sure it's still 16 by 32 to the outside. And uh, you'll notice that the panels, oh, I'm actually noticing a detail here, if the panels are laying over the insulation, um, what exactly is going to be, how many panels are going to fit on the long side and the short side? We'll decide, we'll, um, there's going to be a detail where one of the panels at the very end, the last panel we put in, what if it does not fit in because it's like a half inch too big or a quarter inch even too big, right? What happens there? Well, we have to take for one, it's called the adjustment panel. It's one of the panels that are labeled as adjustment. Basically, we take one of the vertical studs, um, and uh, the, the plywood should be on loosely. So we uh, kind of lift up the plywood and just move the move that one stud over in and out just just a little bit. It'll be like probably a half an inch. But you don't want to leave that gap in there because that would be a weak connection. So we want to leave that one stud loose take out the two screws or three screws on top and bottom and just move it over or in and if you have to move it in you have to cut out your bottom plate and top plate and just just shrink it just half an inch or whatever so that's that's the final adjustment you have to do in a field if things don't fit i mean ideally they would fit but you can't tell because you're going to have sill gaskets between the modules and they'll add up to a certain thickness you can't really predict that uh, so we're, we're preparing for a final adjustment at the end, which is what we did in the first house. The last module we put in, you might have to shrink it or expand it just a little bit. And that means you can still build it pretty much completely, but you'll just move the side, uh, side vertical member uh, to one side or the other. So I think that's, that's about all we need to cover on the, on the, cheat, sheet, the cheat sheet for the sill plate, which, uh, which says that uh, for the doors, like the hidden doors, for example, they're, they're a little different. Actually, let's show the detail on that hidden door. I put a link to that. So look at the hidden door. This explains why this hidden door. So this is a Sweet Home 3D file. You can download it if you want. So I'm going to open that. I'm going to open that in Sweet Home 3D just to show what that detail in there looks like. So we don't think he is opening. I'm going to open up that file. Um, that probably went 
to downloads. Oh yeah, no, hidden door does it. Well, we save those files as that zip, so you actually all you need to do is, uh, I guess, extract it. Uh, so it should appear here. If I try to open it, hidden door. <clears throat> okay, so you notice an artifact on a hidden door where, uh, let's try to expand that. Look at what's going on at the bottom. Uh, you see that, uh, I can't see it, Sweet Home doesn't really let you rotate in this other direction, but you see there's this bottom plate that this wall is like normal, but it will be one and a half inches down with this, this, this is going to become the sill plate, actually. So this one member at the bottom actually has to be treated wood, so we cut that out of treated wood. And the rest of it, it looks like a standard door. And also, if you notice some other details here, uh, notice the, the, the header. It's not 2 by 12, that's like 2 by 10. I can tell that. Um, we went to 2 by 12 simply so that we don't have any 2 by 10 lumber at all, so that it simplifies the material count. It's stronger and doesn't cost much more, so we said, okay, let's simplify the BOM, because otherwise you have to have another line item for uh, 2 by 10s. We just said, hey, let's avoid that. We just got 2 by 4, 2 by 6, and 2 by 12, just to keep it simple. I mean, there's all kinds of wood dimensions. We just kept it to 3, keep it simple. Um, so that's the artifact there. You have the standard blocking, you've got the standard thing, like some of the people who built the doors so might find this familiar. Um, if it's uh, the first floor, it's going to have blocking on top and bottom. Here we're showing the 2 by 4 blocking instead of 2 by 2s. Uh, but that artifact down there. So. Um, that's just, just as far as the hidden door modules. Now on the second floor, we don't have a sill plate on the second floor. So this module on the second floor will not have this, this bottom like that. It will be straight across there. Uh, and it's going to be 8 feet, because the second floor is 8 feet. So that's, that's the main thing I wanted to show about the sill plate, so we're just kind of see how day by day we, we learn little additional details. There's a bunch of details that one has to remember, but for anything, you got to just learn a few basic details. And you can logic this out, too. Like if you, if you said, okay, I'm actually making a hidden door that's designed for expansion. Would I design it like this? Would you design it like this? Or would you do it differently? Would you just keep the sill plate in there and have to cut it out later? Oh, uh, it's going to be kind of messy to cut it out later because it now it's all accessible. Otherwise, you have to get a... I guess it's not too hard. You take a reciprocating saw. Saws on. Saws all, yeah. Reciprocating saw. And then you can cut it out like that. Um, and some of the other details there, you don't want to screw it in from the bottom there. Here, when you put... Yeah, so that's another detail. Um, when you put that, that bottom element... Because you're going to take it out for expansion, if you want to go to a 2,000 square feet house, you want to screw in that bottom piece from the top, so you can take those screws out and punch it out. Otherwise, you're going to have to break the, through those screws if you screw it in from the bottom, so there's details like that. But you could do this thing without this bottom plate and just leave the, the entire sill plate on. I mean, I guess it's not too much harder, uh, but we decided the design decision there was, okay, let's make it so simple that you don't have to cut anything. You just unscrew things. So so the difference between the two operations is you take a screw, screw gun, your, your drill, and take out all this, put in the door. That's it. No deconstruction, like in destroying, uh, just cutting things. So that's how we decided to do it. If you're doing it, it's, you know, you're in cons under construction when you do the expansion, so it might say, oh, well, it doesn't matter, I just have the cell out there anyway, I'm going to just cut it off. Um, but this does make it easier. So, I mean, I'm not sure if there's a huge case for pre-cutting like this. Um, I can't really think of a huge one because you can just cut it off after you're done. Um, but the other thing you have to remember, make sure you don't put any mud sill anchors or the metal anchors in that location so that you don't have to take those out too, like cut them with a grinder. Uh, so in the design of the sill plate, the, the mud sill anchors are designed such that you're not ever going over any other doors because you'd have to cut it out later if you were doing that. And actually, last detail on, on this. The location, um, the overall design here, the location of all the mud sill anchors, where did that one go? Are the metal anchors and metal brackets that are sunk into the foundation? Yeah. Fold over the yeah, the 
that's it. And looking at the detail of the mud sign for locations, we put those. There's not one that's like, well, actually here, this was a mess up. We, we already did put it in there because we changed what, when we were, after we did the foundation, we decided to move the door over for, for reasons of interior design. So actually we did put a mud sill anchor there, that dot there, which we just have to cut out now. So it's in a way. Um, so little details like that. Now, uh, just, just one more thing. When you put the door in, the door is even with the wall. Okay, let's look at the detail uh, here. What happens, well, let's go to the front door. What happens when you put in the door, because uh, this is that insulation, where the door is like this. It's all the way equal with the insulation, because that's a 5.5 across that, right? Now, there would be a gap under the door there because um, the sill plate is only up to there. So what we do, ah, that's the reason why we did that right now. Ah, okay, there is a reason why we put that. What we did, can anyone tell me now the reason why we did the cutout? I see it now. Why we did the cutout before, like for, well here, well we're talking about the expansion door. Why did we take the cutout already? What's the cutout? The cutout was this thing I showed on on Sweet Home. We took this thing, this is part of the sill plate, so we cut the sill plate and put it instead into the wall module. Uh, but that's not the, the sill plate. Well, that is the sill plate. Um, you know, the bottom plate. The bottom. That is a 2x6. We took the 2x4 and where do we put that? We put it because this, say it's the expansion door, it's going to be dripping over the foundation because the it's over the insulation. Uh, insulation would be there. So what we did in detail, we took that 2x4. So let's see. Let's draw that. So we took that 2x4, we put it on edge, and we attached it to the foundation to, to match the width of the insulation. That's, that's in detail. Um, so we took it, because the door has to sit on something, it cannot sit over the insulation. When you walk on it, it will like bend down. So we put that cut out and put it attached to the, it's called a ram set gun. It's a gun that you hit with a hammer or trigger it to get a bullet, and it shoots a nail into the concrete. Uh, so we take, we didn't do this yet, we have to take this cut out and shoot it with these concrete nails into the side. So when you put the door in there later, or the sill plate now, it has something to sit on. We did the same thing for the front. These are some of the critical details. I mean, these are, this is, a, this is the kind of stuff you have to pay attention to, otherwise you're going to get leaks, leaks in the house, your door is going to, the bottom of the door frame is going to break. But here too, we did the same thing. What we did there was take that piece of 2x4 of the sill plate that we cut out and attached it vertically where, we, where the door can sit now in place of the insulation. So there is no insulation down there. Insulation would actually be a little below um, this 2x4. So details like that. You'll see it in the field. It will make more sense. But um, that's the technical design of the, the actual foundation if you're going to build it for real. Any questions? Is that for like rain dripping down the front of the door? It's more for if you, you're stepping on a sill of the door, mm -hmm. there'll be nothing supporting that front to 1.5 inches where the, it's sitting on top of insulation. So, so you'll end up breaking the door. Um, that's more what it's for there. Uh, when the rest of the wall have insulation, like, um, so you've got that two by four under the door so that the door can sit on it. Mm -hmm. Below that, so you still have below that. Below that, yeah, it's insulated. So you're just taking out this little notch of insulation for where you put that two by four in. Do the rest of the walls have insulation between yeah. the sill, between bare sill plate and the foundation? Well, the insulation is at the front. We're looking from top, from the top here. So the insulation, that's the shallow insulated footer, which goes down 
and then out goes down and out away from the foundation. So that's the detail. And you can do that for very cold temperatures. You can do a shallow insulated footer with the horizontal coming out. And if you make that three feet long or four feet long, you can be in, in North Dakota if it's like four foot wide. So you don't have to dig way down. You can go down over insulation for about 12 inches or so, and then out, and then kind of backfill that in. You effectively have the same thing as if you went down the insulation, because you care about frost getting under the foundation. There is no difference if you put the insulation out. The frost is stopped where the insulation ends, and has to go travel underneath to the house. So that's the way to do it if you don't want to do a lot of earth moving, if you're in a backhoe to dig way down, like four feet in North Dakota or something, if you don't want to do that, just put it out. That's that's what we would propose doing. As so so if you have done, you also have to extend the foundation there. Yeah. So that's a lot more expensive concrete. Right. Uh, good point. If you did that going down, yeah, you'd have to use much more concrete for a much deeper footer. Here we're, we're doing like an 18 inch footer, and I think that would... I think it's 18 or close to that, even in the very cold zones, if you use the shallow insulated footer technique. So, um, that's, that's that. Any other questions? So that's a, you know, that's a code compliant kind of foundation that's relatively easy to build. And uh, that's it. Okay, so let's finish here and then continue with design. So see if you can, based on the exercise we did now, uh, continue uh, towards the full digital model. And there's some people joining us, like David, I think he said he wants to do modules, also help us in all this. But yeah, continue to see how far we can get and then continue in the shop later on. Um, we're, we're finishing on the IC, the second, the double door. What's the status in the shop? Working on the double door, we can do the, uh, the interior walls. They're done. So that's one of the ones we have. Except for the ones that are not sure. Yeah. yeah, I'm going to get those dimensions out. What I'm going to do is just take a look at the, um, the file, like the free file, for example, we have the one for the platform of the second floor, the second floor platform. The cutout for the staircase is basically going to determine exactly how, how long those rows are because they're right around the edge of that and then I'll extract those dimensions. It's kind of one of these, like, the, it's similar to the exercise we just did right now, which is, okay, you know the dimensions, you have to kind of backtrack and say, well, what exactly is that dimension? Like, if you look at the, the sweet home model, um, can't read the directions off it and we don't have a final model in FreeCAD. In FreeCAD, you could read the directions off and dimensions off it. Right now we don't have that, so, but I can logic that out pretty quickly. I, I have the file, for example, for the floor platform, which has the stairway cutout. And we know that the walls go around the stairway, therefore you know exactly how long the walls are. So, And then the dividing wall, say, in the bedrooms, that will be determined by, okay, well, that's the distance from where the stair staircase is. There's a door there, and then three more modules. Well, they have to add up to that number that you read off the CAD. So, uh, you can kind of logic it out, but I'm working around, okay, I know we've got 16 by 32 for the floor, we've got like 4 by something, but or 10 or whatever for the cutout for the stairway, and you can backtrack from there, uh, making a logical deduction of the rest of the dimensions, which is kind of like thinking on the feet. Sometimes in the field you might have to say, oh, what is that? Well, 2 plus 3 equals 4 kind of deal, uh, you know, you measure up the dimensions and so as you remember some of the conceptual details of what, what you're working with, then you can backtrack to dimensions and knowledge of how this is designed. So, and it's, compared to any house, I mean, this is like super simple. It's already got a lot of, you know, a lot of detail. But that's the reason why house building is so complicated, because there is no regularity in a regular house. Uh, the carpenters just do it, and it costs a lot to do it, because there's, there is like way more detail that you have to consider in more complex shapes. So, anything else? Discrepancy between day six and day seven. There is. Let's take a look at it. What's the discrepancy? My case went to the Discord channel. There are a few things missing from the cut list. Okay. So I Let's fix it. Okay. It should. 2021, we don't have access, but... Oh. Um, it's, if you scroll up, 
Yesterday. So yesterday is a document. Uh, in the present year, 2021 channel, it's called a message from yesterday. It's quoted in like a text with text that says, correction, the cut list mm -hmm. the doors. There's four, two by four, seven by seven. Okay, let's see. Five, two by six, one, two by eight. So I think it will be at least in the day seven. There's just got left behind. Somehow, so we, we went back to day six and we cut those extra pieces. Oh, they, they were missing? Yeah. So, does that make sense? So, two by four is seven and a half? Those with the uh, blocking? Yeah. Two studs on each side. Yeah. And five, two by six, <laughs> 11, seven, eight circles, yeah. Two by six, 93. That sounds. That's the plate of um, the. Go below the header. Below the header. Right. Okay. And two eleven by three. What from two by four block is that? That's for between the header blocks. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, that's, we just reverse engineered that, so that's okay. useful to you. You can, you can add yeah. that to the cutlass for me. Okay. Can somebody paste this to the current document? You don't have access to which one? The, the day seven, day eight, the 128 design lesson one. I don't think we have edit access to those. Okay, day eight, I think I just, uh, that we were editing just before, so you do have access. Day seven, I'll correct that. Yeah, anyone can edit, I'm kind of good. Day seven. Day seven, when you put the cut list on day seven, is um, the information of the real information. It is mm -hmm. really in it. So okay. So if you want to add up the cut list, you can do it. When you put your own car and you can do it. on a micro track with this one. So one side was bind binding up and it was the fact that well so you have the drive sprocket that goes on the chain and the chain has like the drive sprocket it needs to be tapered so it goes into the chain links. It was like not really tapered in some places so it was catching on the side and just the track would just get stuck so we just tapered it down. That's what Mr. Jeff did, he ground it down a little bit so now it's going in. But that's an issue that we build so we're gonna build this thing kind of this style of drive, so we got to pay attention to make sure you have the tapered ends of the sprocket, and we build those. We, we cut those out just by hand. Actually, people build that by hand. Um, so, yeah, now it spins. We can do 360s in this at any time. So, that's great. <laughs> So, nicely, so, which document? Uh, day 7, uh, one, one of the most important days for our investment day 7. The last three documents in the video is the document. Okay, let me see. That's good, so you guys are picking up mistakes, that's good. Um, which one? Uh, the last three portions are the A and the quarter of the last three. Okay, so the last, which ones? They don't, they don't, they don't, um, two of them, they don't, 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 they don
Okay, sorry, which one? No, the last three. The last three, the last three. Last three that's actually a number, that's so it's easier to see which one? 10, 11, 12? Uh, I have just added those corrections, so I think 10 means 6, 7, 8. 6, 7, 8? Refresh, well, don't refresh, it should show up. So I'm not going to... 8 and 3 eighths. Uh, yeah, 6, 7, 8. What's going on? Okay, let me see this. Um, did I actually edit day six instead of editing day seven? Let me just look at day six. Um, yeah, it's a mistake. Uh, I don't like what's going on there because a lot of those are black. The green are what I, I mark for having checked it. So let me see what's, what day six looks like. Six and messed it up. So day six is where uh, I was working on day six. So let's transfer that slide over. Let's take a look at the slide after that, and then I guess we got to add the. What do we got to add to it? That was the verified stuff. So let's see. What's the difference? We got nine in the first one. And let's put them side by side to the old list. So that's good. Two by six. Oh man. Um, if we cut all of that, then it's all going to be. Whichever ones don't match are not going to be good because the green should be probably the final. So let's see what's what's matching. Um, I'm gonna put it ones that match. And we're just gonna go through it one by one. Um, two by six, maybe six. Okay, that's good.
two by four, seven and a half. I see two. Where should we two? Uh, we were actually thinking that maybe we should have two uh, at the top, just to just off the So um, there's a reason for the bottom, and that is to attach the inside channel, the utility channel. I see. Not just for spacing the studs. No. Okay. For the top, the plywood reaches the the header piece, of it, so we don't need it at the top. Um, so it'll be just extra. Not for mounting the plywood, but still to space the studs. Oh, you're just using that as a spacer? Yeah. I mean, we can remove it after we screw, yeah. it, screw it in, so I guess. Okay. Yeah, it's just blocking. Um, okay. Or maybe blocking is the wrong word. It's uh, cheating. No so I would use, what I would do then, uh, if the workflow allows it, use your spaces. You don't have to cut two extras. Just use that one at the top and then use it at the bottom when you're done with it. So attach the top first and then attach the bottom. Well, something like that. It's not too much harder to cut. Um, and if they're both in place at the same time, then there's less likelihood that it'll slip. If we're moving from. I mean, I guess. It's not hard to cut it. You just use an extra material that, you know, if you're doing that everywhere, you've got all this plug. It's just materials use. But, um, sure. The way I would work it is, like, attach one thing at, like, if you've got the correct pieces, as soon as you have two pieces that belong there, attach them. Like, say you've got the vertical and the top one, just attach it right there, bam, done. Um, well, not exactly, because you have to consider which ones allow you still to get all the screw holes, screws wherever you need them. Uh, like, for example, if that has the, I'm seeing the top plate with the header with top and thing below it, yeah, for example, you've got to put the insulation in there already. Uh, sure. So things like that. So you have to pay attention to that. But typically, whenever possible, like as soon as you got two pieces in your hand, put them together. Don't let them, you know, don't put them and try to arrange everything and then shift it again, shift it again. Fix it. It's, it's a constraint. Uh, it makes it, a lot of times it makes it easier. So you don't have to, like, say we've got the outer frame. You know, that you can definitely do if you have, if you have one that's simpler. So yeah. Um, so you don't necessarily have to like get it all arranged if you know that you've got the right pieces. But if you're, if you're using that to figure out, oh, do I have the right pieces? And yeah, it, it makes sense to like arrange everything. Yeah. Um, we, 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 the four pieces need one and so we could just straight away and uh, fix them together. Yeah. yeah, I'd say so. I'd say so. They're identical and just, yeah. Sure. Um, well, actually, not the 72, because then you can't get those, you can't do the, the cripples. So there you have to be good. But yeah, the side ones, I don't see. Well, actually, no, no, no. The, the, for the same reason, you, okay. For the same reason, you want to put the two side ones together. Because you see the 72 inch ones, you probably want to, it's easier to screw in from the, the outside there. Uh, otherwise, you're just screwing in from the side. It's a weaker connection. So the point being, when we're done with it, we follow typically like one procedure that's optimal. Uh, we don't have that right now. That would be the detailed step by step. If we're teaching somebody how we will now, we haven't done that. So we're recording the video, like we can learn from it what worked the best. Uh, so ideally the video catches it and we see, oh, okay. Uh, in the video we caught that and then we caught you that, oh, you're actually doing it from the side where it should be from, from the end. Uh, so we can catch things like that and then optimize the, the build procedure. So if somebody remotely can actually take the video and go to the videotape, you know, look at the, the history of it, and just like studying gameplay and sports, you can pretty much uh, have feedback loops happening there towards optimizing the, the actual build procedure. Uh, that could make it go faster because before you like nail this down to you might have to build it a few times to say oh this is optimal um, the more collaborators can can contribute to that especially if someone's 
who's a skilled person, they can take a look at this. Oh, you want to do this first, and they'll see that immediately. You know, so things like that. Um, you want to document that so others can contribute. But okay, let's finish up some of this. Uh, so, so you cut four, but we really need two. So but let's keep it at two because we need two there. Um, 7.5 2 by 6 12 inch Okay, the 2 by 6 12 inch we still need because that's the base, the, the bottom plates That's not in the list, right? So let's add Two by six, twelve inch. And now, yeah, so you rip the eleven inch from two by fours. Yeah, you could do that. Um, that's good. That's good. Let's see, another one. So, so, the eight and, so are all those extraneous? They look extraneous, right? So we just miscut them. Let's see if we can use it elsewhere. Um, okay, didn't mess up too much there. Um, the 38s, I, I don't see any case for that, right? The eight and three quarter. No. By six, four and seven eighths. No, so cut those out. Yeah, so I think I think we're good there. Okay, so ten pieces. All right, so let's. Uh, so this one we can remove. Six, we can remove that 